We'll be reading the part of the sailors, the part of the sailors on the ship. So for you'll have your part in the bulletin. And once your part is done, then you can just not look at your bulletin and listen to us tell the rest of the story. OK, so be sure and read the parts of the sailors for that. And also the first call to worship. I just want to bring your attention. We'll begin with the call to worship. And right after Raymond starts with, he's saying, Jesus, come alongside us and calls us by name. You'll see in your bulletins. You all will respond by saying your own name and then follow me. So look at the first page of your bulletin. You see under call to worship, Raymond will say, Jesus comes alongside us and calls us by name. You will say, Kristen, follow me. Ruth, follow me. Right? Okay, so the idea here is Christ calls each of us by name to follow him. With that, I'll say welcome, and I'm so glad you're here, and I pray blessings on our worship this morning. Jesus comes alongside us and calls us by name. Raymond, follow me. A simple call, a hard call, because following requires leaving. And we look around to see who else Jesus could be talking to. And we look around and see the trappings of life we know. It's hard to leave our nets and walk away from the lake. But we have come this far to this place where we can listen and be transformed. Please join in singing the gathering hymn, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past, number 632 in your red hymnals. Yeah. 
invite you to rise if you aren't able for confession. Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Dear friends, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant, renew your creation, restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. By the authority of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We now join in singing our song of praise. accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated and we turn to scripture for today. A reading from Jonah. Jonah is a book of very good satire. The story of a prophet, Jonah, who does exactly the opposite of what good prophets are supposed to do. Instead of going to where God commands, Nineveh, Jonah goes by boat in the opposite direction to Tarshish. After being swallowed and spit up by a fish, he finally finds himself going to Nineveh, 
preaches the shortest sermon ever, and then complains that God has mercy on the Ninevites. Listen as we read the story and join in by reading the parts of the sailors. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness is before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. For the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came up upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought or so that we do not perish. The th sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. They, that, that, then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What, what is, is this, this that, that you have done? done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What, what shall, shall we do to you, you that, that the sea may, may quiet down, down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O oh Lord, Lord, we pray, pray do, do not, not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do, do not, not make us guilty of innocent, innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have, have done, done as it pleases you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Uh, and the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from the evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish in the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from, from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? 
Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come over Jonah to give shade over his head and to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to today. God. Please join in reading the psalm of the day responsively. Psalm 62 is a prayer of trust in God in the face of persecution. Join me in reading verses of the psalm responsively. For God alone I wait in in silence. Truly, my hope is in God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold so that I shall never be shaken. In God is my deliverance and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in God always, O people. Pour out your hearts before the one who is our refuge. And now we turn to our gospel for today. I invite you to stand as you are able for our gospel. We continue in the book of Mark. Remember, everyone, this is the year of Mark. We'll be making our way through this gospel together this year. Before Jesus calls his first disciples, he proclaims a message that becomes known as the gospel, which is literally good news from God. Hear now the gospel according to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Kids, come on up for children. Hey, it's good to see you. I missed you guys. How's it going? How's it going, kiddo? You had basketball practice? Basketball is my favorite sport. I love it. I love it. Are you guys watching the Knicks these days? You guys, are you guys Knicks fans? I know you're, no, not really. Okay, no, not really. So you're not watching the Knicks? Well, they're, they're playing pretty well this year. Mm -hmm. um, did you play in the snow? Yeah, did you make a snowman? No, did you throw snowballs? Oh, did you get them? You got each other? Yeah, all right. Have you gone fishing lately? No. Oh, really? You gone ice fishing? No, I see a mom back there saying no, no. Well, guys, we're talking about fishing this morning in our Bible passage, Jesus. So remember at Christmas, what do we celebrate at Christmas? Jesus. That's always a good answer. Yes, Jesus' birthday. So Christmas is when we celebrate Jesus being born. Now our story today, Jesus is all grown up. 
And he's starting to go around um, a place called the Sea of Galilee. It's a big lake. It's a lake near where he, a lake. Yeah, there's, well, no, but he's in that area, like just around the lake. It's called the Sea of Galilee. You can call it the Lake of Galilee. Um, and he's starting to teach people about God's, uh, God's kingdom, God's new way of living. And what happens at a lake? What happens around? What do people do at lakes? They go fishing, right? Ice fishing, yes. Okay, so we have fisher. People love to fish in our house. Yeah, and this is a fishing. Mm -hmm. This is a fishing uh, box. Now, let's look and see what you have to do for fishing. What are things you need for fishing? You do need bait. So this is fake bait. I'm going to hold this because there's a hook in it. What is this? What is this supposed to look like? Uh, a frog. Yeah, it's a frog. Look at it. It skips on the water. It's good bait. What else do you can you this? What are those look like? Yeah, but what does it look like? A worm. Yeah, worms. Yep, yep, yep. Do you know what these are? No. So what you do is you put the string through here, and then you put a bait that goes under the water. And this sits on top of the water so that if a fish grabs the bait, it goes whoop. Yes, that's exactly right. Bobber, okay. Yeah, and then you take it on and eat the fish, that's true. All right, so this is what we use for real fishing nowadays. This is a little bit different when the disciple, when back in Jesus' day. But people were fishing around the lake, and Jesus was like, I need some helpers. I want to have some helpers with me to go tell people about God. And he, he came upon some fishermen who were fishing. They were fishing for fish. And he said, I'm going I'm to, can I have your help in fishing for people? Which meant, can I have your help in gathering people to, to come to me, to, to learn how to love people? So if you're going to be a fisher for Jesus, you need a different kind of fishing box with different things. Because we don't use like worms to get, <laughs> to get people for Jesus, right? We use different things. So let's open it up. Open it up. Other way. Okay. Yep. Pull it, pull it. So these are ways that we can tell other people about Jesus. The first way is, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. So we can like, when you're talking with your friends and they're like, what'd you do this weekend? You can say, well, I went to church and I heard a story about Jesus. Sometimes it's that easy. Okay. What's another thing? What's this? Yeah, what's that? It's a songbook. You can kind of sing, you can sing songs about Jesus, too. Like, what are some songs we sing? Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, this time. Yeah, we can sing about Jesus. Okay, what's the next thing? Ben, you want to bring it out? Here, let Ben bring it out. What's this? So what does a heart mean? A heart means love. It does mean love. Show everybody. Show everybody. Yeah, heart means love. So what can that mean? That can mean that you can be really kind to people at the, on the playground, right? What are other ways you can show people love? Uh, by hugging them. Yes, that's a very good way, by hugging them. How else? Sure, you can give your mom a kiss. That shows her God's love, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, being nice. Okay, so this, so this is what we do. We tell people about Jesus in the way we act towards each other. So these are bookmarks. bookmarks. Yeah, bookmarks. You can bring one to your sister too. Okay. And these, this can be, you can keep it in a favorite book. You can keep it in your room. You could even give it away. These to are, another person. Sure, to another person. Actually, I'm going to give you guys, yeah. That's another example of how you share Jesus. Yeah, and that's how you become fishers for Jesus. Whoa. All right, here, let's say a prayer. Let's grab each other's hands. Well, it's kind of hard, but we can, you can hold on to it. All right, great. All right, good. You ready? You ready? All right. Ready? Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Help us, Help us to, show others to show others the way to you. To you. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, many years ago, when my husband and I were in our late 20s, we realized something. We realized that we were not in college anymore. I mean, we knew that. We knew that intellectually, of course, that we weren't 18 and 19 or 20 years old anymore. But more specifically, we realized that our bodies weren't that age. We realized that we weren't growing anymore. That had actually been for, stopped for a while. And that in many ways, our lives had become more sedentary than in college. We walked to the train and went to our places of work every day. So, and so we got exercise that way. And we were active and still playing tennis and running when we could. But activity was something we had to build into our schedule. Unlike in college, where it seemed that activity just came so much easier and our bodies were younger too. So we had this moment in our late 20s, maybe right around 30, that we realized our daily habits had changed and our bodies had to, and we just weren't fit as we wanted to be. So we, um, and we realized it was affecting even our daily life. We, have an iron, we had an iron skillet. Do you guys have iron skillets, cast iron skillets? Man, are they heavy. <laughs> and I remember like going down to the cabinet and grabbing it and faltering with one hand and saying, that's enough. We got to do something about this. So we decided to, we were annoyed by it. So we decided to um, start this exercise program from the magazine called Outside Magazine. Anybody know that? It's a great magazine, by the way. It's still out. Um, and the, it was a whole fitness program. I think it was called Shape of Your Life. And I had never before followed a fitness program ever. I never had felt the need to, but I needed to then. In broad strokes, this program alternated between aerobic exercise and resistance training. So one day you would do an aerobic activity like running or biking, something to get your heart rate up. And then the next day you would do resistance training. Resistance training is another way of saying strength training, building strength. It's an exercise that's designed to make you stronger. So often if you're doing resistance training, you'll do weightlifting in some way whether it's you know, free weights or something like that. But you can also use your body in resistance training. Like a push-up is resistance training because you're lifting your own body weight. Sit-ups, same thing. So that's called resistance training because it uses an outside resistance, body weight, free weights, to exercise your muscles. Your body grows muscle by resisting that outside thing. Now, I was full steam ahead on the aerobic portion of this exercise program. I like to run. I was pretty naturally good at it. But the resistance training part was something I resisted. I was not very excited about it at all. I started the program, and I found ways to avoid the resistance days. I met a friend instead of exercising, or I was just too tired to do it. Sooner than later, though, I recognized that if I wanted to build weight, I wanted to get stronger, I just had to do it. I had to do it. And so it took me a while. It was very step by step. It was so simple and yet so hard to accept that if I wanted to get stronger, I had to do this resistance training. And so I started. And it took me a while, but I got the hang of it. In today's gospel, we have a similar thing going on here. It's a similar if-then sort of scenario. Now, obviously, it has nothing to do with physical fitness, although being out in the outdoors and fishing is certainly a nice thing to do, although that's not what we're talking about here. It has to do with following Jesus. And the if-then statement is, if you want to follow Jesus, then you will have to resist. If you follow Jesus, you will have to resist. Now, you might be saying to yourself, um, I don't see the word resist in the gospel passage. And you're right. That word resist is not in the passage for today. But if we take a closer look, resistance is there. Jesus announces his ministry by saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So resist isn't stated, but his words here cue everyone in on the fact that the status quo is being challenged. The status quo is being resisted. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. So if we break those things up, the time is 
fulfilled. What does he mean here? Well, John the Baptist, that first opening frame, that John the Baptist has been arrested. Remember, John is the voice of the one crying out in the universe, in the, in the wilderness and the universe, crying out in the wilderness that the Messiah had come. And now he had been arrested. His voice had been silenced. It was time for Jesus' voice to come on the scene. And then that second part, the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus, the Messiah, was himself the inbreaking of the kingdom. With him, God's reign enters our space and time. But it's not like the Messiah comes bringing in God's reign and there's nothing else there, right? He inbreaks into a place where there is something, something to resist. His kingdom, God's kingdom, is a reign alternative to the earthly kingdom, alternative to the Roman Empire who is in charge then, alternative to the religious leaders who held the power, an alternative to the power of the well-off who didn't care for those in need. And because God's reign is an alternative, it will rub up against those powers. It will have to resist them. So if you want to follow Jesus, you will have to resist. Resistance is in the next line, too. Jesus says, repent and believe in the good news. Now, for you word people out there, the Greek word for repent is metanoia there. And you might have heard that before from me up here in the pulpit. Repent can mean turn around. It's often paired with repent from your sins, which means turn from your sin, turn holy from your sin. But another meaning of that word can mean something more like wrap your head around this. Wrap your head around me, Jesus is saying. Wrap your head around the fact that God is among you. Flipping the tables on power, bringing healing and the good news of God's mercy and grace Reorient the way you think. Resist the old way. Wrap your head around me the new way. So if you want to follow Jesus, you have to resist. The if then, that if you want to follow Jesus, you have to resist, is something we know all too well in our lives. Now, this resistance can take many forms. It can be in the context of how we live together in society and the larger society out there. Last Sunday, we honored Dr. King and his legacy of demanding equality for all Americans, all people, really, no matter their color, no matter what they make for a living. This demand was born out of his belief that God created all, human, all humanity equally in God's image and that Jesus died for all of us, not just some. As a follower of Christ, Dr. King rubbed up against the powers that be, resisted the status quo. In other words, his life was one of resistance, right? In Jesus' name. Resistance can also take place in the context of our personal lives. Our daily lives of living in the world bring so much that stand at odds with God's kingdom. Our world is a world that because we live on this side of Christ's return, we are vulnerable to sickness. We are vulnerable to illness. We are vulnerable to death. Remember, Jesus breaks into that world and starts to heal people. The first healing that takes place in Mark is to drive out demons. Jesus resisting that thing that would separate us from God. Jesus who heals means we resist the despair that settles in when sickness is part of our lives or the lives of people we love. We resist that despair that sets in because of Christ. We resist the despair that sets in when we look face to face with death because we follow someone who conquered it. The resistance is real. It is. And we resist because we follow a Messiah whose very body, his very body is resistance to the forces that undo us in our lives. And they undo us, don't they? 
So following Jesus means resistance, resistance to any forces that wield destruction, forces that wield separation, forces that wield despair and death. But resistance is hard, is it not? Resistance is tiring. Sometimes, and maybe often, we don't want to resist. It's like me not wanting to start the resistance training back with the story I started with you. It was easier just to sit on the couch or meet a friend for coffee or go for an extra run than to lift those weights. I resisted resistance training. I heard a joke about that, actually. The joke goes like this. I pictured it's a gym. There's a trainer there, and there's a, a guy at the gym. And the trainer says to this guy, would you like to join in our resistance training class? And the guy says, nope. And the trainer says, that's what I like to hear. You sound perfect for it. Get it? He says no to resistance training. <laughs> yeah, that's how we are sometimes with resistance, right? We get like that too. It's hard, and we don't butt up against the injustice we see. Resistance is hard, so we give in to the despair of the world. So what to do? Well, an answer might be seen in the disciples in our gospel for today. They had no idea. Let's be clear about this. They had no idea what they're getting into. Like, they knew about John, those men, likely, but they had no clue what this Jesus was about to, the journey they were about to take with him. None at all. And yet they heard these words, follow me, and they put one foot in front of the other and followed, to the point of some of them leaving their dad right there in the boat. Does that strike you? Leaving the, with the hired people, it says in our gospel? As followers of Christ, this is not rocket science, and it sounds so simple sometimes we just overlook it, but we got to put one foot in front of the other like those disciples to act, to do, to start resistance, to start resistance training. I just had to start, follow the program, open the magazine. I couldn't think my way through it, unfortunately. That would be lovely if I could think my way <laughs> to finding stronger muscles, just had to do it. And I think it's similar in our spiritual lives. The way we start is from spending time in the wor word, spending time with Christ, giving space for the spirit to work in the stories of Christ's healing. That's a good place to start, everybody. If you are feeling like giving in, pick a story of Christ's healing and read it every single day this week. Pick a story in one of our four Gospels of Christ's resurrection and read that once every day a week. This past week with our confirmands, we went through the Gospels together, reading resurrection stories from each Gospel. Do that every day. See what resistance looks like in Jesus' own action. Pray that God gives you the strength to resist whatever is pushing against joy. As we take these steps in our walk of faith, our walk of faith becomes a walk of resistance too. So we resist because Christ resists. If you follow Christ, you and I have to resist. Just like if you want to get stronger, you have to do resistance training. So this third week of Epiphany, remember this is the season of Christ being revealed to us to us having epiphanies about Christ. So let this be how Christ is revealed to us today as the great resistor. Let's resist the big and small ways that the world makes us question our worth. Let us resist the big and small ways that the suffering of this world, our own and others, causes us to spare. For the great resistor breaks into this world and gives us a glimpse of what is to come. The great resistor is also there with us when we resist the unfairness, when we resist the suffering, when we resist despair. Brothers and sisters, we're part of a resisting faith. We're part of a resurrection faith. How's that for resistance for you? Resurrection. Resistance. We resist anything that deals us death. 
because we follow life. May the peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join in singing the hymn of the day, number 588 in your hymnals. Join me in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now come to the time of prayer in our service. Before we begin, please share any additional prayer requests.
wanted to give you an update on some of the people for whom we're praying this morning. Last Sunday, we announced that Charlie's mom, um, her name is Mary Emily. Charlie's mom is in the hospital right now. He's with her at Long, on Long Island a couple days a week, and they might actually be watching right now. Um, I just, w w prayers for Mary Emily and um, strength for her family, Charlie and his three sisters and Charlie's family, Holly and Sarah, as they spend this time with Mary Emily. Also, I wanted to make a couple um, updates regarding people for whom we're praying, um, names from our own family. We've been praying for Tucker. Tucker is a dear friend of our family, a dear friend of Luke's uh, family friend. He's a senior in high school and is battling lymphoma. Um, and so we continue to ask for your prayers um, of healing and of strength for him and his family as they go through this difficult time. Also prayers for my brother-in-law, Jonathan, who is fighting colorectal cancer. Continued prayers for him and his battle against this illness. And so, yes, as Raymond said, any other prayers, please share them in. As we pray, please respond to each petition of hear us, O God, with the words, your mercy is great. As we celebrate Christ's coming as one of us, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. God, our rock and deliverance, do not, do not let your church be shaken. We trust you never abandon your promises to the most vulnerable amongst us. Give your church wisdom and empathy in its varied ministries. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our hope and refuge, you place the fish in the sea, guide our care of oceans and all creatures that live in them. Hold us accountable for actions that endanger water sources and the people who depend on them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, who proclaims judgment and offer mercy, be a model to the leaders of our nation and the world. As they lead, may they follow in your ways of justice and truth. We continue to lift up to you those who are caught up in the wars between Israel and Hamas and Ukraine and Russia and the violent conflict in the Sudan. Bring an end to the violence and loss of life in those places. We also pray for our own country as we begin this year of presidential election. Inspire citizens and leaders alike to engage in civil discourse regarding the pressing needs of our time. Grant discernment and wisdom for the good of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God who cares for the suffering, keep safe any who live under threat of violence, those living in poverty, and any among us who are ill or in pain, especially Keisha, Mary Emily, Maurice, Judith, John, Christina, Joy, Ava, Cindy, Bob, Peter, Craig, Bailey, Jill, Rena, Mariana, Inga, Pear, Peter, Kathy, Patrick, Alan, Myrtle, Gurpreet, Melinda, Robin, Trista, Shiloh, Lawrence, Jonathan, Tucker, Felix, Heidi, Joseph, Kirsten, Robert, and those ill with COVID. We also lift up the Reed family, for the mom who's battling cancer. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of resurrection and new life, as the first disciples share the good news, empower us and, and this faith community to be open to your call. When we are uncertain of your call, assure us. When we have strayed from your ways, redirect us. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. 
God, who tenderly hold the saints, we trust you welcome them into your care. We pray especially for the family and friends of Renata, friend and former colleague of Raymond, who passed away from complications due to COVID. Oh, God of grace, thank you for the gift of Renata and comfort those who grieve. May they and we, along with them, place our hope in your salvation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the peace of our risen Christ be with you today and always. Please share greetings of peace with those around your pew. God's peace to everyone. God's peace to those online. God's peace to Betty up on the balcony. God's peace, Betty. Just a few words uh, before we move into communion. Um, we serve communion up here. So after we've done our communion liturgy, you'll be welcome to come join us um, at the railing up here. And we have communion bread that has been made by our confirmation students. Yay, confirmation students. Um, it's really good bread. Uh, and it does have gluten. Um, so we have communion bread. Um, and if you can't have gluten, I do have wafers. Those have gluten in them too, but there's not as much gluten. Um, but if you, uh, you are welcome to come up and you can also just, if you can't have the bread, you're welcome to have just the wine. Um, that's, that, that does it for communion. <laughs> you can have um, just one element um, and you can have some time of reflection. So I invite you to come to communion in that way, where you can remain in your seats too. If you'd like to come up and just receive a blessing, you can um, put your hands on your chest like that, but all are welcome at Christ's table. This is also the time in our surfeits for offering. If you brought, brought offering, we have our offering plate out with North Exxon up here too. So you brought a gift of possession, please remember to put it there at some point. And I'll offer this prayer. Please pray with me for our offering. God of splendor, as the wise men offered gifts most rare at thy cradle rude and bare, so may we with holy joy, pure and free from sin's alloy, all our costliest treasures bring, Christ to thee, our heavenly King. Amen. I invite you to rise now as we move into communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give us praise and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, singing. Holy, holy, holy,
which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your spirit in our gathering, within this meal, among your people, throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your spirit, in your church without end. Amen. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, Christ's table is ready, and all are invited. You may be seated.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Giver of every gift, Christ's body is our food, and we are Christ's body. Raise us to life by your power for the benefit of all and to your glory now and forever. Amen. Now, as we get ready to get sent into the world, I invite you to rise so that I might bless you. Dear friends, God Almighty sends you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. The hand of God protect you. The holy angels accompany you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. We'll stay on our feet for our last hymn, Be Thou My Vision. It's number 793 in your red hymnals. Go in peace, you are God's beloved. Thanks be to God.